Onyang. In the previous video, we analyzed the Mealy sequential circuit. If you have not yet watched that or completed the associated follow along, I strongly encourage you to do that first. We'll be going relatively quickly in this video as we perform some more analysis with more analysis. This is a Moore sequential circuit. How can we tell? It is a sequential circuit because the output signal is a function of memory, which is represented by these flip-flop outputs Q2 and Q0. It is not a Mealy machine because the current input X is not part of the output logic. A Moore machine will always follow this model of flip-flop outputs being the only inputs to this output logic. As a result, there is no need for the extra strobed D flip-flop like we saw in the Mealy machine. Here, a rapidly fluctuating input signal could not cause fluctuations in the output signal, since these flip-flop outputs can only change at clock edges. This means that all three of these JK flip-flops are part of the state memory. Begin your analysis of the circuit by identifying the Boolean equations for all flip-flop instructions. Pause the video while you do so. The equations for J2 and K2 are shown here, which are taken from these leftmost logic gates. The equations for J1 and K1 are shown here, which are taken from these rightmost logic gates. And the equations for J0 and K0 are so simple they don't need separate combinational circuits. Looking at the inputs to flip-flop 0, X prime feeds in to both of them. At this stage, we can also find the equation for the output logic, taken from this top AND gate. I decided to name that signal Z. With the equations, we can derive the next state table. As usual, there are three broad sections, present state, flip-flop inputs, and next state. Because there are three flip-flops in memory in this example, this table gets a little longer. All possible combinations of Q2, Q1, Q0 are listed here from 000 through 111. I decided to name these state codes A through H. There is one input signal X. We need to know how the circuit behaves when leaving each state at each possible input. Therefore, state A is listed twice, once with x equals 0 and once with x equal 1. State B is listed twice, once with x equals 0 and once with x equal 1, and so on, all the way down. Over the next couple slides, I will show you first the completed middle columns and then the completed rightmost columns. Before I do, try it out for yourself. Pause the video while you do. Here are my results for the middle columns. I brought up the Boolean equations to help us see this a little better. A column like K0 is simple to fill out. We just write in the complemented values of x. Others, like J2, take a little more focus. All of the ones you see here are rows where either Q1 and X are both high, or Q1 and Q0 are both high. I can complete the Z column now, even though it is not in the middle section of the table. Output logic is combinational. Inspect this table closely to see if you have any discrepancies with your results. Then, take some time to complete the remaining columns. Here are my results. Recall that to complete these Q columns, reference the flip-flop characteristic table and focus purely on columns with matching subscripts. So for the next Q2, I look at the present Q2, J2, and K2. This top row is in no change mode. So the starting zero remains a zero. The second row is in reset mode. So Q2 is forced to become a zero. Repeat this all the way down for Q2, then repeat for Q1, then Q0. Finally, we reach the last state name column. State code 001 has been named B on the left side, so I call it B on the right side. 
state code 010 has been named C on the left side. So I call it C on the right side. And so on for all remaining rows. Allow me to repeat that the difficulty here is not in any individual step. It is maintaining focus across all of these steps. Be patient. Haste makes waste. With the table complete, we move on to the state diagram. Try this yourself on the follow along worksheet. Here is my state diagram. The table tells us that when at state A with an input of zero, the circuit moves on to state B. Also, when at state A with an input of one, the circuit moves on to state C. And so on for all remaining nodes. As a double check, I note there were 16 rows on the table, and there are 16 arrows on this diagram, two leaving each node. Now, what patterns do you notice in the state diagram? I notice that every input of zero causes the circuit to move up by one node, and every input of one causes the circuit to move up by two nodes. This pattern stops at F which cycles back to either A or B. Meanwhile, nodes G and H are off on their own island. Since there is no arrow pointing to them, they could not be reached during normal operation of the circuit. As a side note, with asynchronous preset, we could force the circuit to go to state H, but then it would jump back to A or B on the next clock edge. Overall, there appear to be six useful states. We will often run into this situation where there are unused state codes, simply because our memory capability is a little larger than what we need. Finally, look at the stars. The output is high for both cases when leaving node F. This tells us that it does not matter what the input signal is. If the circuit is at F, it is guaranteed to output high on the next clock cycle. Hmm. The output signal is not a function of the current inputs. That sounds just like a more machine. Now let's see the circuit in action in the simulator. I have the state diagram on the right side for comparison. Notice that I have binary probes on each Q value, which allows us to monitor the current state. Right now, the state code is 011, which is state D. I want to start at the beginning. So I will flip the reset switch, which immediately changes the state to 000, or A. Because this is an asynchronous switch, I did not need to flip the clock to cause that change to go through. Now I'll activate the reset switch. The input is currently 0. When I flip the clock, the state code updates to 001. Good news! State A should jump to state B with an input of 0. I flip the clock again, and the circuit moves to state C. Again, and we move to state D, then E, then F. That input of zero just moves the circuit through the letters in order. While at F, the output signal is one for the first time, as it should be. One more clock cycle with an input of zero brings us back around to A, and the output drops low once more. Let's try it again with an input of 1. One clock cycle makes us jump from A to C, as it should according to the state diagram. Another causes a jump from C to E. Then one more brings you back around to A. This time the output signal never equaled 1 because we didn't pass through F. I'm not required to hold the input signal constant. It can change many times between clock cycles. Those changes don't matter. You can see that we are remaining at state A. All that matters is the value of x at the moment the clock changes. Let's set the input to 1 and then flip the clock. We see the expected jump to C. I'll then change the input to 0. We then move to D. I can change the input back to 1. Then the next clock cycle jumps to F. So that input can change from one clock cycle to the next. What's the purpose of this circuit? This one has an educational purpose, not a practical one. 
The goal is to show you how a sequential circuit can be set up to perform a predictable pattern. Predictable patterns allow us to make designs that accomplish more practical goals. We'll get to that next.